All right, all right, all right. We're here Saturday morning conversation. This is the new show. Yes, indeed. It's called Caveman and Iron Monkey Do Wild Shit. Yes, indeed. Where we're going to be on wild ass adventures all the time. Yeah. Uh, but for the purposes of this, this is also the interview portion yes. brought to you by Mega Trucking and Repair. Yeah. Uh, we got the man, the myth, the legend, John Van Hees, yes. PBA right. champion. Yes. Hall of Famer. Yes. Pro Shop owner. Okay. Roto Grip, Roto Grip representative. Sure, indeed. Uh, he is the god in all things bowling here in the great state of Rhode Island. We're inside the AMF Cranston Lanes in Cranston, Rhode Island. Yes. Uh, welcome. Thanks, yes. gentlemen. Appreciate you guys having me on. And he's a Raider fan, too. And Big he's a Raider, Raider fan. fan. Big yes. Raider fan. Born and raised in Los Angeles, though, so it's a hometown thing. Uh, I moved okay. to the Rhode Island area when I was 13. Oh, all so right. I'm oh, an L.A. guy. Raiders, Lakers, Dodgers, Trojans. Oh, nice. Just an L.A. guy. Oh, nice. I, I thought you were just originally from Rhode Island. Nope. 13 years old since. Oh, all so, right. Oh, so you're, an, Im- you're an implant like we're implants. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> he's from Detroit. I'm a Detroit guy. I'm from Brooklyn, New York. Not to be confused with like Brooklyn, Michigan, or somewhere else, but you know, people like to do that sometimes. Brooklyn, Alabama. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Brookline, 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 Massachusetts. Huh? Wow. Yeah, yeah. Nah, not me. So, Brooklyn, New York. <laughs> we're gonna get right into the meat of it, man. We're gonna we're gonna talk talk shop. Yep. Uh, with John, and then we're gonna get all on the lanes, and I'm gonna teach John a couple things about bowling. Yeah. Can't wait. <laughs> yeah, and I'm not gonna try to embarrass my kids. Like, damn, that's my dad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm gonna try to you know keep it reasonable. <laughs> so, when did you start bowling? I was seven years old, about seven, seven and a half years old, at a okay. birthday party. My oh. dad took me. Now my dad was a regional pro, so bowling was always in my family. My mom bowled a little bit and stuff like that. So there was always a bowling environment around me. But uh, seven, seven and a half is when I actually got on the lanes, bowled a little bit, loved it at a birthday party. So my dad helped me get into a league when I was seven and a half, and I started bowling pretty much that summer on. When nice. I was in California. I was in Riverside, California at that time. Oh, all right. So you actually started bowling in Cali, too. Yep. yep. Oh, nice. Yeah, I started bowling there. And, uh, I mean, I didn't get serious into it until my teens, probably. Like, really, really heavy into it. But California was definitely the start. Started bowling some state tournaments there as a young guy. 9, 10, 11 years old. Traveling to San Diego in the L.A. area. Didn't really go up north very much. But got a chance to get some exposure down there. And then, like I said, my family all did it. So just kept going. That's nice. So you, do you feel like you had an advantage because your dad was a pro? Like a regional pro or? No, because I knew more than my dad till I was like 25. Oh, That's wow. I, yeah, I mean, don't we all? <laughs> right. So oh, yeah. I, I didn't really tap into him as much as I could have as a young guy because he got me to a certain point fundamentally and physically, but I was able to get myself past that pretty quickly. And a lot of what he did was old school, very methodical, physical game related. And the game at my youth was starting to really evolve quickly. I mean, we're all around the same age, so you right. kind of saw the game go from the plastic to the urethane to the resins. Well, resin balls hit like 91, 92, right in that time frame, and it really elevated and changed the game as far as scoring pace goes and the ability for balls to do what they do nowadays. Mm. So when you saw that happen, you know, that was kind of the, the handing of the torch, in a sense, equipment and performance-wise for those guys to us. So when I was 11, 12, I grew up with that stuff on uh, so, so i was able to right and my dad was hard i mean he was very tough on me as far as the way my bowling developed he made me throw a plastic ball straight ball um fingertip grip so i was like 14 till i learned to average 185 190 with a straight ball so i had to become really accurate oh, wow. fairly good spare shooter like he said you had to learn how to bowl it's like physically learn how to bowl before you go out there and start doing all the things that these bowling balls are going to allow and now the technology is going when forward. did you know that you had a gift though like like rather than picking up something like basketball or baseball or tennis what was it really and truly like? Was it really your father? And when did you realize you had a gift? High school. High Just, school? Yeah, high school. Because I was, I always considered myself an athlete. You know, I wasn't like an overwhelmingly big guy or sizable. So football and basketball weren't like big sports for me. Okay. Um, baseball, I love baseball still to this day. It's probably my number one love as far as a sport goes. I love baseball. I was really good at it in high school. Uh, I didn't have work ethic anywhere near what you needed to be to be, you know, a major league level player and stuff like that. I had a lot of good hand-eye coordination, a lot of natural talent, but I never really tapped that. Okay. When I bowled in high school, I had that same thing. Where I was a really good athlete. I could average pretty high, and I was always among the better kids, but I always placed among the top in most of my tournaments. Like, even after a bad tournament, too, I'd still, next term would be top five, next one would be top three, next one would be top five, and then I'd win one, then I'd win one. Mm. And I was like, you know, it just came so much more easy to me in the bowling sense so late teens, kind of into high school, I started to really lean that direction, getting away from all the other sports, get away from baseball, mm. and start focusing all my time and my efforts into my bowling. Nice. 
but oh. 17, 18, 19, probably right around that time frame. Oh, nice. I don't know. So everybody wants to throw the perfect game, right? Absolutely. So mm. I don't have any, but I know you have some. You pulled some against me. So <laughs> <laughs> when did you throw your first 300? Was it like super early? Like I hear a lot of, like, there was an article out a couple months ago about the kid who was like 11 throwing a 300 game. Yeah, I think 10, like maybe, maybe even like, I don't think it's 8 years old, but 10 years old I believe is the record now for youngest to ever to mm. throw one. Um, I was 15. I threw my first one. It was in a no-tap tournament. So a no-tap, uh, at that one, it was a nine-pin count or better. So if you threw a nine or a strike, it was a strike. If you uh, got nine, you struck. If you got ten, you struck. Oh, okay. Um, I bowled it in that tournament. It was a non-sanctioned event in southeastern Massachusetts at a bowling center called Fairhaven at the time. And when I shot it, it was a non-sanctioned event, and I threw 12 real strikes for the 300 game. So that was my wow. first one. Uh, and I was, like, happy about it, but I didn't get any awards for it, didn't get any recognition for it because it wasn't a sanctioned event. And back then, uh, sanctioning was a big, important thing. It's just like it is now, but, I mean, it was really important then because you didn't have as many organizations and things like that so credibility really came with that sanctioning so i didn't get it for it and i was pretty disappointed my dad gave me his 300 ring to be like ah, oh, you know it's you did it it's cool right. we all saw it we all know what happened but yeah two weeks later i shot my actual first one in a sanctioned league in rhode island at 15 nice. it was um i was three months shy of turning 16 in quidnick lanes in middletown rhode island okay so i got that one got that sanctioned one that was january 97 you still now i'm sure you've thrown many since yeah. then. How many have you thrown? I've thrown seven in the PBA. I've thrown well over 100 in leagues, tournaments, things like that. Honestly, haven't kept count since about 2008. I had about 42 at that time because I used to write them all down, the dates, the locations I shot them in, even the game I shot them in in some cases, just to kind of learn what games I was good in and stuff like that. Is there a record for that? Do you know what that would be? I mean, there's a couple guys that are well into the two and 300 range now. Wow. Um, Parker Bone one time told me that in passing, I mean, he's well into the hundreds of the PBA, 100, 130 in the PBA, somewhere in that range, but he's got probably three or 400 more, like, outside of that in bowling. So what the true record is, I couldn't honestly tell you. It's a hard uh, number to really track because uh, okay. so many get missed in between the cracks in our sport because of sanctionings being turned in and things like that. I mean, uh, I know I've got a bunch that never got turned. Right. I mean, I've for money... Most of my 300s that I got paid a bunch of money for mm-hmm. were non-sanctioned events. Uh, you know, you go bowl down in New Jersey, we'll go to New York, we bowl the you UBA, get the money, but like not that. the notif- notification, uh, like recognition for doing it. Right. There's certain amounts of money you have to make in order for them to send you 1099s, things like that. So, uh, you know, this yeah, is going yeah. back 15, 10, 20 years when I first started getting out there and traveling. Really before the internet. So before, like, you could, like, take a picture and be like, see, I did it. Oh, yeah. See, yeah, I, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. It wasn't see? much of a paper trail. Exactly. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Things have yeah. changed a little bit now. story and hope there was somebody there to see. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Right. I oh, remember wait. the tales of when he beat me on some, on, and he rolled a three hundred on me. Damn, that was supposed to be my day. <laughs> yep. I uh, I almost threw one pre bowl, which is like when you bowl before. Uh, like uh, your like, like no, like I can't bowl this week, so I'm gonna pre bowl and put my scores uh, in for that week. Uh, uh, okay. And I went, I threw eleven in a row, and left. Uh, oh no, I threw ten in a row and left like I don't know something ugly, and then ended up finishing like two seventy nine. Yeah, so this score, I mean, it was bad. You learn three hundreds. I mean, it's hard. Obviously, some people do downplay it a little bit once they have a couple and stuff like that. Because you know, once you get it, you realize that all you're trying to do is just go through that experience, that emotion for the first time, mm-hmm. trying to get your first one. But after you get one or you get two, you realize that the shot, in the first frame, and the shot, in the twelfth frame are the same shots. They have to strike. So you have to make good shots. So the one in the ninth and tenth and eleventh shouldn't feel any different than the ones in the first and second. Do you ever get bored and try to switch hands? Not switch hands. I will mess around and throw some plastic balls, things like that. Um, I'm terrible left-handed, and I leave it at that. Oh. I don't try and mess with that too much. Oh, okay. uh, I did actually have a doctor recommend to me, though, to bowl a little bit left-handed to create a little more symmetry in my body uh, because, yeah. obviously, with all the bowling right-handed, Scoliosis, hundreds of thousands of games and stuff, right? Shoulders being out of line, hips yeah. and knees and things like that. So there was a little bit of a, hey, you should bowl a little bit left-handed every couple weeks just to keep your body kind of... Balance. Symmetric more, yeah. right? Okay. So I did that a little bit, but it's just not fun. Well, it's not fun to not be good at something. So yeah, I don't like to do like, it. Damn, I, <laughs> like damn, I stink at this left hand. Like you yeah. know what? Screw this shit. I'm done. Let, you know, let me find something else to do. All right. But it was cool because we actually did that for a training camp. One of the first times I did it mm-hmm. is we were learning to coach younger players and beginning players. Mm-hmm. So they made you bowl left-handed after you're so good right-handed and they made me bowl left-handed and I was awful and they were like okay see how frustrated you are how bad you are at it that's how a beginner is going to feel that's how somebody coming to you for the experience and the knowledge is going to feel so do that a little bit just understand how hard it is to do what you do well and then go coach somebody and that'll help you teach them and put yourself in their shoes a little bit easier so it was a pretty cool spot to do that 
So now you represent Roto Grip. Yep. Roto Grip Vice Inserts. Um, signed with them just recently over this break, so I haven't had a chance to do any of the logos on the shirts and stuff like that. I got some patches and things. Um, Roto Grip and my pro shops are usually the logos I wear on the actual jerseys when I compete out on the tours at home and any local events. Always have those logos on. Nice. And so those are, you throw those you throw these balls exclusively, or are you like on that Tiger Woods shit where you're like Roto Grip, but you like a another kind of ball that just does something <laughs> for you, or like <laughs> we yeah, just scrub off the logo. <laughs> yeah, no, I don't mess around with any other brands. Roto Grip okay. and Storm are my two. So Storm is actually the parent company of Roto Grip. Okay. Um, Storm is the biggest company in bowling as far as high performance bowling balls go. Cleaners, polishes. I mean, they are they are the one. So I'm under the best label possible, and they gave me a chance to represent a brand that's very important to them. Got lots of good stuff. A couple of the best players on the planet are all Roto Grip guys. Anthony Simonson, um, Marshall Kent's a Storm guy. Got so many young guys. The Tang brothers are both Storm and Roto. Um, so you see a lot of uh, trying to create parity on the brands. Storm obviously has a much, much bigger staff. Rotogrip, I believe, only has eight national staffers. But in this area, one of the reasons why I ended up with Rotogrip was the business side of it and the ability to pair up with my partner. He's a Storm guy, so now I'm a Rotogrip guy. Okay. Now we got yeah. it all. How, how did that come about? How did, the, how did they approach you with that sponsorship? So I was a tour rep for another brand last year doing the men's and women's touring. So I did the equipment, uh, preparation, basically the coach for the men's and ladies tours. Mm -hmm. And I loved it, had a great time doing it and stuff. But after being gone so many days on the road and with the upcoming season having a larger schedule, uh, more days on the road probably in my future, Mm -hmm. and just knowing what I had just gone through and stuff like that, I sat down with the family, sat down with my partner, we talked about the amount of time I was gone. And it put a lot of stress on them. So as much as I loved it, as much as it was good for me and I think the growth for me was there, Mm -hmm. I, I had to take into account what it was doing to other people. And... Everybody was behind me, and they were going to back me going to do it again. But you could kind of tell in the conversations, the mood that everybody was in, having the conversations. Yeah. And I realized I had, to, I had to figure out a way to stay home a little bit more. So I opened up my avenues. I said, hey, guys, I'm going to listen to what everybody else has to say. And I'm going to see what decision, you know, what comes across my table that makes it the best for me to stay home with my family. Mm. And helps me put as much as I have been on the table with somebody else if it is. Or with you guys, we'll, we'll see what happens. Mm, and Rotor Grip and Storm came in, and, I mean, they put it down... It was almost a no questions asked deal. There was so over the top and such an opportunity. I had to get it. Nice. So, nice. All right. So you've been on the tour for a little while. You've won some championships. And uh, so my question right now is like, how, how, what would you, how would you differentiate what you do on the pro tour versus what I do in league play? Like, what's the major difference? Because people think bowling is like, oh, just take the ball, throw straight, hit the pins, which it is at the basic but there's a reason why I'm not on the pro tour. Yeah, on the scratch level. And you're on the pro tour. So, like, where's the difference in the games with okay. the two? I mean, there's a lot of levels to it. So it depends on where you're competing at locally and stuff like that. The thing that makes the pros so much better is their ability to repeat shots, make adjustments in their equipment, make adjustments in their physical game, uh, handle their lifestyle on the road, deal with injuries, deal with the amount of games you bowl, deal with all the stuff your hand does. Um, deal with the highs and the lows, deal with your family life. I mean, able to put everything together because it takes a special kind of person to be able to go out on the road that much and really not have a life at home like you would have a traditional life at home. You know, they're not in their house 320 days a year, only occasionally leaving for weekends. They're on the road 200, 250 days a year, traveling the world, some of those top-level guys. So the lifestyle, I think, really is what becomes the hardest thing because at the end of it all, once you get on the lanes, it's just bold. So able to handle everything around it and able to keep yourself in like top competitive shape to go through the grind of all those traveling hours, all those traveling miles, all those games. Mm. I mean, that's what really separates the good from the great. So it's a lot more yeah. mental than, Absolutely. than physical. But Absolutely. like, what about the, the conditions? Like, I know that you guys play on the pro pattern. Like, how much different is the pro pattern from the house shot? They give you a much less room for error. So on a house shot, they're going to give you definition. They're going to give you a lot of oil in one place. They're going to give you a lot of dry in one place. So they put conditioner on the lane, oil on the lane. And they put it for certain distances, and they blend it in certain ways. So if they showed you a picture of it, it would look like a map almost in a sense of where the oil is on the lane. You could tell, okay, there's a heavy amount of oil here. There's very little amount of oil here for this distance. So you can see that, and then you go out there and throw your bowling ball, and you'll see your bowling ball react on the lane to that. Um, bowling balls, the more aggressive they are, they're designed to create friction. 
friction grabs the lane, creates hook. It's like a car tire. That's one of the analogies we like to use back and forth. Mm. If you think of a bowling ball, the outside shell is your tire, the inside is your engine. So you need to make sure your engines and your tires match the road surface you're competing on. When you get that and you put all those variables in there, as those change, it's fast on the pro levels. The rev rates are higher. The guys use a lot more surface. These guys are skilled. They can play all parts of the lane. So you see the lanes tear apart much faster. So on the pro tours, they give you no definition, really, in a lot of the patterns. You have to build your own. Okay. On the house shots, they give you lots of definition, and you kind of just have to do whatever the lane gives you, in a sense, right from the get-go. And there is some transition on house patterns, obviously, but you don't see it as much because the definition is so high that your ball is going to see one or the other and that's where some guys can struggle or do really well with that. So creating the definition on the lane as a pro is the hardest part because when you're in house shot, it's easy. You throw it to the right, it hooks. Keep it inside, it doesn't hook a whole lot. <laughs> right. You go out on tour, you throw it to the right, it doesn't hook. You keep it inside, and it hooks a mile, and you're like, oh boy. Right. It's a much, much different animal. So you have to learn to see those things and then learn how to bowl in that environment. The patterns don't start really all that much harder, but as they go on, as the tournament goes longer and longer, that's when you start seeing it really become obvious who's good and who's not. Do you get people cheating, asking, like, the lane mechanic, like, all right, so how did you oil the lane, like, before, like, a tournament? Or, like, all right, so I know how the oil is on the lane and how the conditions are before. Is, is that allowed? Or is that I mean, you can talk amongst your ball reps. You can ask the lane man anytime. The PBA has his designated lane guy that does the lanes out there. Uh, we go to the national tournaments and things like that. They have lane guys. They'll bring in uh, Kegel is a company that does lane conditions. Brunswick does lane conditions. Mm-hmm. Um, a lot of different companies do the lane maintenance for us. So when you go there, you can get information from those guys. But I can tell you, even though you see it, even though you know a lot about it, it helps you prepare, which is why it's very important to know. Mm-hmm. Once you're out there, though, Still got to make the shots and have the reality in front yeah, of you. What like, happens, right, happens. It, yeah, we all kind of heavy on the right side today, so you might want to be careful of that. But right. Be like, yo, say, say that a little bit quiet. You know, one, that's too loud. One of the things I always wanted, I always wondered, and I, we talked about it, I think, a couple years back, is like, how come, like, the bigger shoe companies and, like, the like sports athletic companies, like the Under Armors and the Nikes and the Reeboks, like, how come they haven't, like, ventured into the bowling arena? Because there's so many people that bowl not necessarily on the pro level but like on the amateur level and like in the in the uh like the league level yeah the civilian there's gotta be like like the civilian like like a hundred hundred thousand bowlers out there at least that are like registered bowlers but like i can't go buy nike bowling shoes i have to like have them like cobbled right yeah like is that like is there a reason do you think there's a reason why or like is, is is the pba doing anything to try to get like some of these major like athletic PBA is doing everything they possibly can to bring in as much sponsorship as they can. Obviously, they have a great product to sell. It's like anything else in sponsorship and marketing. You have to be able to sell a product to somebody so that they're willing to invest into it, you know, a time frame, an amount of money, whatever they're going to have to put in to see it be successful, and they want to make money. Somebody wants an ROI, return on their investment, bottom line. So I'm assuming, not knowing, I'm assuming that nobody's been able to put forth something to Nike, Brunswick, uh, Nike, Reebok, um, you know, Under Armour, any of those companies that can get them that funding or that support to get it going. That you have a couple bowling companies that do shoes. Dexter does shoes. They're right. owned by Warren Buffett. I mean, Berkshire Hathaway is a company that owns Dexter Bowling. Mm. So they do tennis shoes, running that could shoes. That be a reason why they don't do that. <laughs> they don't want to mess with him. Right. I mean, that could be one of the things. He might have enough of the market share where they don't feel like they can get in there and get involved. Oh, yeah, because, that's I mean, true. if you think about high-performance shoes, that's where Nike and those guys are going to probably want to initiate the market. And now, Nike did have bowling shoes back in the 80s and 90s. I mean, I have oh, really? guys that still bowl now that have them that are like 30 years old. Oh, yeah. It's pretty oh, wow. wild to see them. I mean, they're old, though. They look like the old um, oh man it was look, uh, look like a they're like the gremlins of uh, shoes yeah they're, they're <laughs> just got that old plain Nike swoosh the big old rubber bottoms oh. can't remember the style name of them though man oh wow but it wasn't the Air Force Ones but they look just like the old can't remember the name of the style oh, of the Nikes, not like but the Cortez or something Cortez that's exactly what oh. they are look just like the old Nike Cortez yep. a little oh, bit more like a rounded damn. toe Oh, There's wow. a couple guys that had those. So Nike did make some shoes back then, but I'm assuming more bowlers than you. Have 14 million bowlers at one point. And then they probably now got you're down out. to like a million, million and a half. I think is where we're at right now. Warren so Buffett probably did squeeze them out though. Yeah. Could have been. Damn. You know, I don't, I don't know exactly. I don't get into the numbers and stuff like that. Of Next what that up, is. conspiracy theories. <laughs> what's your, uh, what's your stance on the two-handed bowler? Oh, it seems wow. to be like the new wave. I think it's fantastic. I really do. Yeah, I mean. When you look back at it and stuff like that, a lot of people are upset because they never put rules on how you deliver the ball. If they did, we would obviously have abided by those rules. But mm. a lot of the argument then becomes, well, these guys wouldn't be as good if they threw it with one hand as they are two-handed. And I don't think that's true either. I think guys are good because they've adapted to the environment they're in. 
Ooh. If these guys could throw two-handed at me, great. I promise you, they probably could have thrown a one-handed at me, great, too, because they have great mindsets, they have great work ethics, they're great players. Well, how do you They've feel been- about the kids doing it, though? Like, do you feel like it's like, you know how, like, Little League doesn't let kids throw the curveball? Early on, like, do you feel like it's like, like tear up their shoulders? No, because when they're doing that for baseball and little league, they're trying to prevent injuries. They're trying to keep kids safe. When you're bowling two handed, you're fine. You're not going to injure yourself any more than you would one handed. You know, that's like that's like basketball and shooting a free throw underhanded. Right. So, like, you could do it as a grown man, but they're like, come on, yeah, grown, yeah, grown ass man, yo, shoot the foul shot overhand. Like, come on, <laughs> stop taking the granny shot. Like, right. some people frown upon the two handed shot. Like an underhanded free throw. Right, but the rule says stand behind this line and mm. get it through the basket. The rule says stand behind that line and knock down all 10 pins. Whatever way you do it, as long as it's a legal delivery, which is basically if you release it and it goes that way, yeah. it's legal. It's just okay. like saying, um, well, you can't throw it left-handed. You have to throw it right-handed. Oh, you must do it. Like, yeah, right. it's and just they do like have that. rules on that. You can't just switch hands in the middle of like a handicap tournament. If they have an average where you're getting pins oh, or right. in a handicap environment, you can't go left-handed, right-handed. Oh. If you're in a scratch environment, you can go left-handed, right-handed all you want because there's no benefit. There's no um, evening of the playing field in any sense. Mm. So lefty, righty, that's okay. Two-handed, whatever. You're good. Yeah, you gotta, you got to make it. Designation up front, right, and then just stick with that throughout the whole match. If you're bowling, because they're going to give you an average on your right hands, and if you bowl left-handed, you'll get a different number and a different average for that hand because you figure your ability's going to change. Mm. So you can't just change them up in the middle of most tournaments. Scratch tournaments, though, you're okay to do it. Mm. We had a guy that bowled in Neba, Chris Vialli, um, our best sponsor, our second best sponsor, Neba, best sponsor, Neba, one of the most fantastic people in the world. Um, he bowled with a torn ACL. So he bowled left-handed for his strike shots and shot his spare shots right-handed off his like right foot mm. because he couldn't slide on his left knee because he tore his left knee playing basketball, I believe. Wow. And, he, and he made a couple cuts in the scratch organization in Nevis. How talented this guy was. He made a couple wow. of our finals bowling left-handed for strike balls and shooting his spares right-handed. Wow. wow. So See, and that, That's what I was thinking, like, if you could possibly do that. Oh, yeah, there's a kid in this area that did backup two-handed. For a long time until he went to college and his basically the need to be able to throw it harder and get more on it became overwhelming and he had to learn to throw it the traditional oh, two-handed way oh, now. Depending so on the shot, he would switch hands? Right. Well, he wouldn't switch hands. He'd just back it up. He'd make it backspin like a lefty or he would throw it normal like a righty. Oh, so wow. So he could change it up that way, right? Oh, shit. Oh, wow. That's, uh, that's impressive. Yeah, yeah, actually, and see, to me, that is talent. Like, what's wrong with, you, you can police it to a certain extent. I'd rather them police the equipment than police the way people deliver a ball. Mm. I can go out there and outwork any two-hander in the world if I choose to. I'll go out there and work, 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 and I can beat anybody. Two-handed, one-handed, it doesn't matter. I mean, the best player in the world right now is Norm Duke. He's got the lowest rev rate, and he throws a one-handed, and the guy's 55. Right. What's wrong? I mean, that's the way it is right now. He's bowling the best there is in the world. So, mm. knocking 10 pins down, it's knocking 10 pins down, no matter how you do it. I love two hand. I think it's fantastic. I wish I would have done it. Yeah. But I didn't, so I do what I got. <laughs> right. Um, who's the who's the best guy that you beat on the lanes? I actually like, have a I have a follow up question to that. But like were you were like, damn. I don't know. Like we were, were you like kinda of maybe questioned yourself a little bit, but then you ended up beating them? As far as like the person that goes or like Yeah, like like we are like like this is the biggest challenge of my bowling career. Like I need to win this. Oh, People-wise, obviously bowling any one of the all-time greats, like bowling Norm Duke, bowling Pete Weber, bowling the Walter Ray, those would be the greatest like matches from an individual standpoint. And I bowled all those guys at least one point or another. Um, I, beat, I beat Walter Ray in New Hampshire in a tournament mm. where Walter actually missed a 10-pin. Like, he's the greatest spare shooter of all time. This guy could literally shoot a 1,000 10-pins and not miss any. Mm. He missed a 10-pin somewhere in like the 7th or 8th or ninth frame in New Hampshire in a tournament called the High Hopes Tournament. It's a benefit for charity. And I doubled in the 10th frame and left a 10 pin on my last ball. So 29 pins in the 10th to win the match by one pin. And oh. earlier in that game, he missed the 10 pin, and that's what led to me having the chance to win that match. Did, did you get on your knees and go, yeah! I gave him a little fist pump. Yes. A few people in the back were a little bit more pumped than I was about it and stuff like that. Because you don't want to show any disrespect to them. I mean, this is this yeah. is the GOAT. You know what I mean? Like, You're right, not right. going to try and throw it. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I can win this one match. This guy's going to laugh. It's, it's, like like, on, it's like dunking on Jordan. Yeah, right, right, dunking on Jordan. <laughs> I would be like, hey, good try, Jordan. Yeah, yeah, I'm going to yeah, walk yeah. away. But. Yeah, act like you've been there before, you know? <laughs> act like this is not going to be the last time you did it. Yeah, yeah. so I, I didn't give it anything oh. overwhelming, nothing crazy to be disrespectful. But I did give it a little fist pump. I mean, Pete Weber, that was probably the coolest one for me because that's the guy that, you know. He talks the most shit. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. No, no, but you see, no, that's that's what you want to be pumped. That's like, it. Especially when somebody talks so much shit and then you beat them, you're like, you know what? Yes, I did. Woo! Yeah. And then you're looking at belly bump everybody. Is there a lot of shit talk on the on the on, on the circuit? I wouldn't say necessarily a lot of talk. There's a lot of antics. 
people will do certain things. Oh, uh, like slow pace shoes down. Uh, tie um, shoes together. Yeah, they'll put towels on your bowling ball. People will move oh. around in the lane. They'll bowl in certain manners. Um, they'll pull their <laughs> ball rep out in between shots. I've had guys go back and talk to their ball rep before the shot is spare, just to take more time and things like that. So, mm. I mean, there is a lot of gamesmanship that happens out there. There's no, like, disrespectful trash talking at the pro level. Mm. Um, you might get a little bit of chirping here and there, but I've, I've never heard too much. You go and bowl some other stuff. You get into more your amateur organizations and some of the stuff like UBA, the underground bowling. You get a lot more talk in there and stuff like that. But that's what the environment calls for. So you mm. really enjoy it and you kind of get into the moment. That, that's like the fight club level of bowling. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, it's, I mean, it's fun. You guys ever want to see bowling at a really fun level, come see a UBA match. It's uh, UBA? Wild. Uh, wild. wild. We might have, we'll have to do that. We might have to do that. pretty cool. I got to get it's my permission good. slips on. Nah, I like to talk a little shit. So. Yeah, you guys would love it. It's fantastic. Yeah, I might have to get my permission. Sign for that one. So where are you? Where are you at next? Where's the next tournament you're bowling? Leaving for Las Vegas on Saturday, June first. Night okay. flight. Uh, we're bowling the national tournament, which is a teams, doubles, and singles event. Uh, a bunch mm-hmm. of guys from around this area going out there and bowling on June third and fourth, Monday, Tuesday. Flying back home that Thursday, and we got a local tournament here in Cranston, um, doubles weekends. Oh, nice. So we'll do that, and then uh, after that, I'm off to New York to uh, Yonkers for a PBA regional, <laughs> the 14th, 15th, and 16th. Be careful of the crackheads from Yonkers. Yeah. Yeah, be careful of the crackheads in Yonkers. I spent a lot of time in Yonkers, bowled a lot of tournaments there. My actual UBA team that I bowl for is out of Brooklyn. So, oh, yeah? Yep. Oh, nice. You see? <laughs> and they bowl Melody Brooklyn? in Brooklyn, so Melody Lanes. You ever been to Brooklyn Bowl? No, I have not. I, like that's one of them places that I love to go in, in Brooklyn. Every time, any, anytime you get a chance, it's in Williamsburg, Brooklyn. Like one time I went, I went bowling, and then all of a sudden they had a live concert. I was like, oh shit, it's a live concert! I just paid the bowl, and now all of a sudden I'm getting a free show. And I'm like, right, I'm done bowling. I walked over to the show, and it was. And then they have a restaurant too. So yeah, that's good. That's the best way to have it. Have restaurants and everything attached oh, to yeah. it. Yeah, especially when it's good food. Right. You right. know. Yeah, I got that perked down in my center, my little local center in Old Mountain Lanes. It's got a restaurant, a coffee shop, and a little 24-lane yeah, bowl center. center yeah. yeah, especially, like, you traveling all the time. Like, you're probably going to be like, oh, man, damn, you guys got this. And I don't want to say a, a name of a restaurant, but, damn, you got this shit whole place. Damn, you ain't got nothing else? Like, yeah. come on. Like, I'm don't... pretty picky eater, too, so. Yeah, <laughs> all right, all right. Yeah, it's always nice when they have a good place like that. And that's what you want to see. You want to see a bowling center that has multiple like revenue streams, multiple entities to draw from. Mm. That's what most centers have become now, all the stuff being built nowadays. To actually invest and show that they care. Right, right, absolutely. And you want it to bring in a younger crowd because bowling, it's not easy for young kids to come bowl. Balls are heavy. I mean, six pounds is the lightest bowling ball you're going to find for a 10-pin you know, game. Mm. Finding a three- or four-year-old boy or a girl to go throw that ball down the lane isn't always that easy. So you want to have video games, redemption, yeah. a family atmosphere where you can bring them in, have a meal. Especially three-game game frames, alley. you know? Right. Especially three-game frames. Right, you right. Know? I mean, we, the junior program is I mean, my son's seven, eight years old. He turned eight this year in the middle of the season. And they're out there bowling three games a league. You get through one or two games and everything's okay. But by that third game, man, it's yep. tough to keep them you yep. know, focused on what's that, going that's on. That's when they so, settle into their true character. <laughs> right. I, I mean, that's a long time. You're talking two hours, two and a half hours. It's yep. a long time to keep a kid occupied. So, Well, I think it's time to get on the lanes now. Oh, we right. want to appreciate you coming through. We're going to step on over to the lanes. and. Uh, oh, yeah. You're going to show us what it's all about. Well, I'm going to show y'all what it's all about. Yeah, nice. I'm going yeah. to start my trash talk early. Nah, come on, man. Like, I'm just not trying to embarrass my kids. Like, <laughs> like, come on. That's trying to put in a good, solid effort. Like, That's it. We're, just we're, give it a good, solid effort, man. That's all you And I do. got my Flintstone twinkle toes approach and coming up to it. You know, but one of my follow-up questions, but uh, as we're wrapping up, um, just as a little light fluff of note, I was asking you about um, movies, right, or TV shows or, like, bowling stuff. But... More so bowling characters Like there's a Al Bundy There's um, the movie Big Lebowski Like character wise Like who's the best one for you? So who represented bowling the best Or who did I enjoy the most? Who did you enjoy the most? Bowling character wise Because I like Al Bundy Number one Then there's Fred Flintstone There's um, Big Lebowski There's Kingpin Got Homer Simpson Homer, Homer Simpson. Simpson Yeah I mean, he, Homer was a big one right So oh, Homer yeah. was probably The coolest one to me Because Simpsons Was so big in my lifetime uh, My right. buddy Donnie's A big Simpsons guy Got a Simpsons bowling ball Simpsons bowling shirt Stuff like that So oh, nice. Homer right. was cool But I would have to say Probably the guy Jesus From the Big Lebowski Oh Is that uh, John Oh uh, Torta, Torta Oh right? What's his name yes. He was in uh, Transformers 2 He was the agent Oh from yeah, yeah John Torta Tutoro? John Tutoro. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, his character was, because that's just, I laughed every time I saw him. 
I, he was dumb as hell. And I, I like Bill Murray's character. He was a real deal dirtbag. Yeah, yeah, he was. Uh, <laughs> and see, there's real life people like that too. So you could kind of yeah, relate to that. There'll one. come a moment in your life when you're gonna have to uh, face the music, and today's your day. <laughs> <laughs> Close or yeah. pull off photo. Yeah, Kingpin was good, man. You still see a lot of Kingpin references in the Bone World. That movie stuck oh, with a man. lot of us. That was a good. You see a lot of those guys on tour, like real deal characters yeah, like that. Also, yeah, Randy Peterson's the announcer for the tour and stuff like that. He was in Kingpin, throwing a couple shots. You saw Parker yeah. Bone and Kingpin in there. Oh yeah. Um, so you've seen the guys that are actually in that movie. That it was a little bit of a crossover because you saw some of the stars that we actually had. Oh no, no, I was talking about like, like on a personal level, like people oh, that are real deal dirtbags like, like that. that way. Oh, well, without, without calling their names, I thought you was calling their dirtbag by name. I know, right? I was no, like, wow, it's getting messy over here. No, no, no. Yeah, that guy. <laughs> Stay away from that guy. No, 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 no. no. no all like, those guys I just mentioned I actually love quite a bit. Uh, no, they're no, there's trust me, they're people. So there's always dirt bags. Oh there's yeah, some shitty people everywhere in the world, man. That's true. So, that's true. M- I, and the funny thing is, there's a couple of them that are on the lanes are just absolutely amazing, and then you get them off the lanes, and it's just not as great. Mm. And vice versa, there's some guys that when they're on the lanes, you know, I'm a little more reserved on the lanes. I don't like to talk a lot. I'm pretty to myself. I'm a pretty shy guy. When I get to know you, I talk. Okay. I don't. I mean, I can. I could walk through a bowling center not know anyone and for seven hours not say a word to anybody and be totally okay. Yeah. But if I knew everybody, I would try and talk to as many people that approached me as I could. Some people like the beast comes out when they're on the lane. Right, right. I'm on the lanes. I mean, it's kick the shit out of you. Yeah. I don't want to be your friend. I want you to change why you even do this sport anymore. I want you to go home and never do it again. Mm. Like, wow. I want to beat you to death. That's, that, that's a good that, mentality. That's on the lane. Make you cry in the corner type. Right, <laughs> right. And on <laughs> that note, I we're going to we cool. get on over to the lanes. All right. Um, Catch John at the tournament, so they're going to be on TV. So the national tournament is live broadcast on web streams and things like that. So bowl.com has that stuff where you can find the tournament. It's the USBC Open Championships. It's in Las Vegas. Can people follow just you? Like with if NASCAR, they live they stream like- our pair, yes. I don't know if they do. I don't well, know the well, schedule. So. Do you have like any personal like online sites where people like could follow you, like fans, and be like, ah, right, well, this is what I'm doing. This I got a is- Facebook page. I got an Instagram page. All right. Um, I don't post as much as I should, but I do post a little bit and stuff like that. Lots of pictures on Instagram. A couple of videos here and there. Mm-hmm. Um. So my Facebook's easy to find. It's just John Van Hees, J-O-N-V-A-N-H-E-E-S. My Instagram is Meta World Hees. <laughs> Laker fan, Ron Artest. I love uh, the name. So, yes, yes, that's right? my dude, right? too. So a little play oh, on yes. words. I like that one. So. I like that. Yeah. Um, Snapchat was the Filthy Brunsky. Oh, nice. So it's coming up with some fun names. And uh, we got a website for the Pro Shop, StrikeFXProShops.com. All uh, one word. Um, F and X are the two letters, not the word FX. It's just the letter F and letter X after strike. Uh, and you can follow up on any of our locations there, find us when we're working and stuff like that. And then the PBA, obviously, any tournaments they have that they're going to have on TV, if I'm competing in it, there's a chance I'm on live TV. If I'm not competing in it, then there's not. Man of world, he's. Huh? Yes, word. Sir. John Van Hees in the building. We're about to go get on this bowling alley. Yes. And, uh... There'll be more video to come. Yeah. Thank you, sir, for coming on. Yes, yes indeed. Thanks, thank, you, thank you. Sir. All right, let's All right, go thanks. hit these lanes. All right. Yeah, DJ Caveman here. We're about to be on these lanes. We're at AMF Cranston. We just finished the interview. We just finished the interview with PBA legend John Van Hees in the building. We're about to get on these lanes. Iron Monkey in the building. We're about to be on these lanes. Vinny the Rock Lord walking through. Uh, any Any pointers? Anything you want to tell us while we get ready to get in there? Got to have good timing. Got to be an athlete. Bowling, same thing. Good foundation. We always teach footwork. So you want to make sure when you throw your shot, you stick the landing. It's always the key thing. A good, nice, easy push away. And then when you go to throw the ball, feet nice and steady, good landing. Keep your feet right under you. You nice. want to have a good foundation. Don't let that head go real steep. That's an exclusive pro tip right there. Expensive I'm a, tips. Expensive <laughs> tips. Expensive <laughs> tips. Yeah, I, uh... I'm still trying to figure out how to learn this fucking phone. Anyway, <laughs> score prediction. Uh, I'm going to win. I'm going to throw 300. Perfect game. Beat the pro. I don't know about that. I don't know about you that. You're going to be my first pro on the books first that I beat. The books, yeah. First pro that I beat on the books. <laughs> It's going to be like Duncan on Jordan today. It's going to oh, be like Duncan on Jordan. It's going to be his body first body horror movie. What are you talking about? <laughs> I am going to be score prediction. For the body count. <laughs> score um, prediction. Um, I'm just trying not to come fourth. That's it. Out of the three man race, I'm not. Yeah, that's all. <laughs> just the trying race. to finish. Yeah, Word. Yeah, Word. Right. All right, we'll put the names in and uh, we're going to get cracking. All right, we're not even warming up. We got. I'm just going to go cold. This is my, this is my, uh, this is how I'm fixing the game right now. Fixing the game. Hold on, we're gonna, 
We got Vinny. We got Vinny. Vinny suing us. You know what I'm saying? The Rock Lord. We got Haley. <laughs> This is a little like, more cold weather bowling there. He's got a cold weather bowling. He got the, he got the uh, 1935 baseball pants on. I guess when you trade Antonio Brown, the shit just really gets downhill. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. 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 Yeah, that's what Put the pressure on him early. About as nimble as you in 41. That's right. Old, I'm the old man on the lanes today. the first straight. Oh, other side, dude. Oh, you got to pack the side in because you're supposed to be on the other side. Oh, oh you're on the wrong way. Oh, all right. Easy, easy. <laughs> cool. Cool, 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 cool. This dude is trying to cheat. Man, he's got on the super new ass bowling shoes right here. Yeah, they got extra, the, baby. These are goodies. Those, those are nice. The, those are the top level bowling shoes as as he should have. All right, this Iron Monkey next shot up. He's not trying to make it easy on me. He's not trying to make it easy on me. <laughs> we over here with Haley. Hey. Haley. Who do you think is going to win so far? Um, definitely not that Um, <laughs> probably him. Oh, uh, she's going with the pro. Yeah, ah. I mean, not, not a gambler. But she's going with the pro. 
I'm about to hurt her feelings. That's what you call, that's what you call the door. The door has been opened right there. That's the door opening. For me. I'm about to kick that shit in. You ready for the strike? It's about to be delicious. I think I'm winning. According to the pro, I'm dunking on Jordan right now. That's what's happening. Pro shot, it would have been in the gutter probably. But I'm winning. Woo! Do you want them to do? Uh, now what I need to do? I need to wipe my balls. I don't think this is a, a, a hetero conversation for me and Do you have a piano? Do you use them through you? 
Yeah, right? The Whitney threw me off. The most important part of the bowling game is picking up the spares. I missed it. Comeback is in full effect. Wipe down the ball, huh? All right. My score is a six to nine. Final frame. Final frame. I still got a shot. Right. I'm gonna need them all, baby.
got me a little nervous there. I had him on the ropes for a minute, but as you can see, he bounced back. Ah, final score, Woo, 261, 225, yeah, 114, baby. I ain't beat. So I didn't dunk on Jordan today, Vinny, but uh, I had him on the ropes. Well, you dunked on Jordan, but so did John Starks. I'm pretty sure the Bulls still won that series. Uh, True. Wait, wait, wait. Damn. Damn, wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I'm a Knicks fan, too. <laughs> Caveman and Iron Monkey do wild shit. John Van Hees, the legend. Myth. The myth. Yes. Bowling 101. Hit us up.